Okay, so we are just going to give it a minute uh, since a lot of people are joining. Uh, Hi, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Hello. Tapio. Ben. Pedro. Hello. And Albion. Okay, great. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to the first seminar of the new monthly virtual seminar series on uh, climate physics organized by the APS Topical Group on the Physics of Climate, or GPC. My name is Pedro Hassanzade from Rice University, and I'm one of the organizers of these seminars. The other organizers are Yao Lei from Princeton, Tiffany Shaw from the University of Chicago, Albion Lawrence from Brandeis University, and Hussein Aloui uh, from the University of Rochester. And I should add that Hussein is the chair elect of GPC, and he has been the driving force behind the study in these uh, seminar series. So the purpose of these seminars is to introduce the broader physics community to some of the fundamental aspects of uh, the climate system and some of the outstanding questions and research opportunities. And we really hope to excite and encourage more physicists uh, at any stage of their career to, to work on, uh, on climate physics. Uh, so with this purpose in mind, uh, we couldn't have thought about a better uh, speaker for the first seminar uh, than Professor Tapio Schneider from Caltech. Tapio studied uh, math and physics at the Albert Ludwig University at Freiburg in Germany. And then he spent a year at the University of Washington as a visiting student in physics. He then went to Princeton University, where he received his PhD from the Atmospheric and Oceanic Science Program, uh, working with uh, Professor Isaac Held. After a year at the Grant Institute, he moved to Caltech, where he's currently the Theodore Wu Professor of Environmental Science and Engineering and a senior research scientist at JPL. Tapio has received many awards, just to name a few. He has received the Sloan and Packard Fellowships, the Holton Junior Scientist Award from the American Geophysical Union, and was named among the top 40 scientists under 40 by the Discover Magazine in 2008. Uh, Papio has done a lot of impactful work on some of the most fundamental aspects of the climate system, uh, particularly on climate dynamics and climate change, and has, has, has emerged as a visionary and a leader in the climate science community. In addition to being a, climate, a great scientist, Papio is a great mentor, and his former students and postdocs are now all around the world doing impactful uh, work as well. Additionally, Tapio has a long track record of training physicists, mathematicians, and engineers to become successful climate scientists. So we are very happy that Tapio has accepted our invitation to give this uh, first seminar. Uh, just uh, one thing about the questions, please uh, type your questions in the Q&A uh, uh, feature, and uh, we will uh, have time at the end for the questions. So without any further ado, Tapio, the floor is yours. Thank you, Pedro, for the introduction, and thank you all for organizing it. I think it's a great idea to uh, start the seminar series, and um, I'm really happy to kick it off. So when Pedro asked me what to talk about, what are fundamental problems in climate, and climate is primarily a physical system. Um, of course, there's biology and chemistry as well, but the most fundamental problems we have right now are physical problems, and the most fundamental problem we have there is probably the problem of turbulence. So I want to talk about that for a bit. Turbulence has been pondered for centuries, uh, famous sketches by Leonardo da Vinci, for example, uh, depicting turbulent flow in quite some detail and musing about its nature. Thinking about turbulent flow goes back even further, of course, back to Aristotle's times. We do know that turbulence is the problem in classical physics. We do not have a very precise def definition of what it is, and we do not have have a solution for turbulence, and I'll talk about what that means. We do have a good working definition of turbulence, though. Um, if you would want to give a working definition, I would say turbulence is characterized by enhanced mixing beyond what mixing you get by molecular processes. It's characterized by nonlinear actions, interactions across scales, and it is characterized by chaos, sensitive dependence on initial conditions. Um, so this is a bit better than you know it when you see it, but you also know it when you see it. In weather forecasting, we are interested in all details of the evolution of a turbulent flow, at least all details on scales larger than perhaps meters or so. That requires us to resolve these details. If you want to simulate a hurricane, here's Hurricane Harvey, for example, in 2017, 
you need to simulate all the details of the turbulent flow giving rise to that hurricane, to the flow around the hurricane and the like. There's no choice but resolving the flow explicitly. That's a weather forecasting problem. In climate, where my focus lies, the problem is a bit different. In some ways, we don't care about all the details of atmospheric or oceanic flow on you know, July 19th, 2050, but we do care about the statistics of that flow. We want to know what the mean cloud cover is because it regulates Earth energy balance. We want to um, know higher moments of the statistics. So in climate modeling, what you would like to have is a way to solve for the statistics of turbulent flows directly, because that is what we care about, not all the, all the small details that once you aggregate them, give rise to the statistics. Now, we do know the equations governing turbulence and I simplified it down to Newton's second law and leaving out a few things like buoyancy, gravity that matters for Earth atmosphere, for example. Newton's second law for fluids, we usually write as A equals F over M, um, which once you expand it out, means the UDT, the acceleration, is the sum of all forces on our right-hand side and the forces are principally, for what I want to consider right now, pressure gradient forces and viscous dissipation. Again, this is just to make it simpler for the sake of presentation here, if you care about the atmosphere, the oceans, there are additional terms that I come back to a rotation stratification. But if this is all you have, Newton's second law becomes an obvious Stokes equation stated at the bottom. There's one control parameter in this equation, it's a Reynolds number that measures the strength of the nonlinear term, u dot grad u term, relative to the viscous dissipation term. If you just do the usual scale analysis, maybe u dot grad u is of, of dimension u squared over L, where u is some velocity scale, L is some length scale. The ratio of these two terms is Reynolds number, ul over mu, the kinematic viscosity. This constro controls the strength of nonlinearity versus viscous damping in the turbulent flow. And this nonlinearity is the cause of all turbulence we have, of course. It arises simply by writing the UDT using the chain rule to expand the total derivative and into this Lagrangian derivative following the flow. You get this u dot grad u term, which we call the advection term because it describes how the velocity changes following the flow. So the Reynolds number would be the one key parameter that the one non dimensional group that matters in the system and it measures nonlinearity. Now, I said in the climate problem, we would want to have a statistical description. The first thing you would want to know in the climate model, climate problem is mean fields. Take the average of the Navier-Stokes equation. So take uh, the overbar to denote some average over some length scale sufficiently large. Um, <clears throat> and you get the equation as stated here. So on the left-hand side, you have this du dt, the partial derivative with respect to time plus the advection term all with bars over the terms. For simplicity, I took density to be constant. You don't have to do it. You just need to change the definition of the average. And there's a pressure gradient term. But the key thing that happens is once you take the average of this u dot grad u term, you acquire a term that's quadratic in fluctuations. Fluctuations here are denoted by the primes. So any primed quantity, if it is a deviation from that average over some length scale, and the red term is the new term arising due to averaging, which we call the Reynolds stress, it's been known since Reynolds times uh, more than 100 years ago, 150 years ago. <clears throat> the crux of the matter is that now we have an equation for an average, but that equation depends on a covariance of velocity fluctuations. So before we had the closed system, once you supplement the Navier-Stokes equation by a continuity equation, it becomes closed. I didn't write down that equation. Um, but now we have an unclosed system because we have a system for quantities that have a bar over it. But in that system, there are quantities involving um, quadratic quantities involving fluctuations appearing in it. So we cannot solve it in a closed fashion. Well, you might think, let's go to the next order, just um, multiply that equation, the Navier-Stokes equation by velocity once again. What you get is an equation for the kinetic energy 
the turbulent kinetic energy is the, the kinetic energy of the fluctuations, so the U prime squared. You can derive an equation for that. And of course, you multiply the Navier-Stokes equation with a quadratic term, with the velocity itself. You get a term that's cubic in fluctuations, among other terms. So here's the turbulent kinetic energy equation that results. On the left-hand side is the time rate of change of turbulent kinetic energy following the flow, the Lagrangian derivative. On the right-hand side are pressure velocity correlations. And then there's this red term appearing, which now is cubic in fluctuations because the kinetic energy itself is quadratic. It's multiplied by the velocity fluctuation in itself. And we have a second order equation that depends on a third order term. There are two additional terms. One is a term that involves the interaction of fluctuations with mean flows that generates kinetic energy. And the third term is a dissipation term that's where the viscous dissipation ends up. In general, we can generate any number of moment equations. We can keep multiplying the Navier-Stokes equation with the velocity. We can get a jth order equation for fluctuation, a jth cumulant equation. It will necessarily depend on a j plus first order term. So this hierarchy of moment equations is not closed at any order. And the crux of the matter is that you cannot truncate in general this hierarchy of moment equations at any order. I'll come to situations where you can get away with it. But in general, you cannot just say, well, I go to second order or fourth order and I stop there. So you get, you have no small parameter in which you can asymptotically expand. And that's why turbulence is such a hard problem. Ed Lorenz wrote a seminal book on the general circulation of the atmosphere. It was very visionary in the 1960s, summarizing the state of knowledge of, at the time. And already he expressed in some ways saying, wouldn't it be nice if you can solve for all these statistics of the atmospheric circulation directly? <clears throat> <clears throat> saying an alternative procedure to simulating all the details of the flow explicitly consists of deriving a new system of equations whose unknown are the statistics themselves. And this procedure can be very effective when the equations are linear. But in the case of nonlinear equations, now we have Stoke has a quadratic nonlinearity, the new system will inevitably contain more unknowns than equations. And he was musing about the hope he had that one day we can come up with a system of equation that solves for the statistics of the flow itself. And we still do not have that, or certainly not to the degree of accuracy we would need. So right now, when we run a climate model, we run it like a weather forecasting model. We simulate all details of the flow, aggregate after the fact, because we cannot solve for the statistics that we actually are interested in directly. Um, the critical challenge here is that in turbulence, you have nonlinear interactions across scales. In fact, I included that in my working definition of turbulence. What you can do is you can take the Navier Stokes equation we started out with and simply Fourier transform it, and then form a kinetic energy equation in Fourier components. So you get a turbulent kinetic energy equation for the kinetic energy here denoted by E hat <clears throat> as a function of wave number in Fourier space. And Assume for simplicity, our turbulence is statistically homogeneous and isotropic. So all I need to worry about here is the scalar wave number rather than the, ve the vector wave number. The equation you get for the turbulent kinetic energy is stated here. So you have a time rate of change. Uh, homogeneity and isotropy simplifies it considerably. There is the viscous dissipation term inside the parentheses on the left-hand side. So dissipation is proportional to k squared to wave number squared. <clears throat> and on the right-hand side is the heart of the matter. There's a divergence of a spectral energy flux F. And this spectral energy flux is what makes turbulence a hard problem because it couples scales. Schematically, what this flux or the divergence of this flux in Fourier space looks like is it's an integral over wave numbers, K and P, um, that couples scales of wave number k to other scales at wave number p through some convolution integral. So you have nonlinear interactions that couple scales, and that make 
solving this problem hard. You can express these nonlinear interactions as a flux through wave number space. And that's how this equation is written. Now you see that dissipation, because it has comes with a del squared in, in the Navier Stokes equation that becomes a k squared in wave number here. It has a k squared out front, meaning that dissipation is enhanced at small scales at large wave numbers. Now, <clears throat> Komogorov had an ingenious insight, which was the following. Because dissipation depends on wave number squared times the energy, it should only occur at very small scales or large wave numbers. Now, assume that there is some range of scales, wave numbers k, where dissipation and generation of turbulent kinetic energy play no substantive role. Then in this range, called the inertial range, there is an energy flux, F, across scales from one wave number to the next. And now if there is no dissipation and no generation, that flux must be constant. If you think back to the equation I just showed, the left-hand side in the statistically steady state will be zero, the right-hand side must be zero, meaning the flux must be constant. And it must then be equal to the dissipation rate at small enough scales, energy is dissipated, <clears throat> so the flux must equal the dissipation rate on average for statistical equilibrium to exist. And that's just written down in the equation at the bottom. Dissipation is, is equal to the integral over the um, k squared times energy, and that has to be equal to the flux in the, in, in the inertial range. Now, if you put these two pieces together, there comes the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in the natural sciences, as Wigner called it. You can do dimensional analysis and say, well, if there's an inertial range and <clears throat> The spectral energy flux in this inertial range depends only on the dissipation rate. And the spectral energy flux is the only thing going on in that inertial range. So you assume there's no direct upscale effect of viscosity. Then it follows that the kinetic energy spectrum has to depend only on the dissipation rate epsilon and on the wave number K. And then Komogorov put the units together. The only way you can get a quantity of unit energy per wave number from wave number K and dissipation rate epsilon is a dimensional combination epsilon to two third power times K to the minus five third power with some coefficient out front, the Komogorov constant. In principle, there could be an upscale effect of viscosity that would lead to modifications um, of the spectrum with an additional function. But these effects tend to be weak. So this was an ingenious insight, really. That yeah, not just in a mango smoothie. Dimension analysis can get you the form of the energy spectrum. You can analyze that further, um, thinking about the energy flux implied here. What you'll find is that the spectrum implies that the interactions are local in spectral space. So one wave number interacts with a neighboring wave number. And <clears throat> well, you can test this experimentally. We would like to find homogeneous and isotropic turbulence. You can generate it in wind tunnels, go far enough away from the walls. Um, actually a really good laboratory of homogeneous and isotropic turbulence, not bothered by any walls. It's the solar wind in outer space. Um, it exhibits inertial range turbulence. You can measure the magnetic field with spacecraft and here are some measurement of um, magnetic field fluctuations with spacecraft that do in fact inhibit this K to the minus five thirds spectrum postulated by Komogorov. And this has been seen over and over again in laboratory experiments and um, numerical simulations and the like. There is some range between where energy is injected and where energy dissipates, Komogorov scale, I'll come to in a moment, where you have an inertial range. Um, the only thing that happens is energy cascading from scale to scale. And the spectrum that you see there is a K to the minus five thirds spectrum. So this is amply confirmed experimentally. Now, <clears throat> I want to talk about climate and we're living on a rotating planet and a rapidly rotating planet. And what this means is that for the large scale flow, Coriolis accelerations are zeroth order important and the stratification of the atmosphere, so there's gravity, inhibits vertical motions. If that is the case, you can make similar arguments as what Komogorov 
did, you just need to take into account that there are additional invariants appearing, something called the potential vorticity, measuring, measuring the rotation of the flow and functions of the potential vorticity, especially a second moment we call the entropy. So this quasi-geostrophic turbulence, we call it, rotational turbulence, has more invariance than just the energy. Running through arguments similar to Komogorov's leads to the conclusion that what is dissipated is not energy at small scales, but entropy. So it's the curl of the velocity field squared. But otherwise, the entropy dissipation rate plays the same role as the energy dissipation rate in 3D. And a number of people, Krechnan, Bachelor, Charney, Lilly, Reins, put the pieces together and came up with what we call the geostrophic turbulence spectrum. If the entropy dissipation rate is what matters, the kinetic energy of <clears throat> turbulence in this rotating, stably stratified situation is proportional to k to the minus three. So you have a steeper power law spectrum in this case. Again, running through what this k to minus three spectrum implies is that now the interactions of one wave number with another are just barely local. They can, they're just on the cusp of potentially becoming non-local meaning in spectral space, meaning that one wave number can interact with a wave number far away, which is important for what is to come. And that spectrum too, you can see in atmospheric data, you can confirm um, with numerical simulation. Here is a atmospheric turbulence spectrum <clears throat> compiled from aircraft data by Gage and Nostrum in the 1980s. And you see there's a K to the minus three range where entropy cascades to smaller scales. And then interestingly, there's a K to minus five third spectral range at smaller scales, at scales below 500 kilometers or so. This K to the minus five third spectral range that you see here has given rise to much speculation. The obvious first guess might be, well, at the smaller scales, you get 3D turbulence. That's probably not what it is. The, the scales are too large for through, true 3D turbulence. It's 500 kilometers where that starts to happen. The better explanation seems to be that you get inertial gravity waves dominating the turbulence at those scales. And they too can give rise to a K to minus five third spectrum. Just to say, you know, K to minus five third came from dimensional analysis. There are many reasons you can see that spectrum and it doesn't just need to be an energy cascade. It probably is not an energy cascade at the scales of hundreds of kilometers. K to minus three, we see in the atmosphere clearly. Now, <clears throat> these are the scales of turbulent flows and how the energy depends on scale. Now you can ask how many scales are there to worry about? Um, the smallest scale in the turbulent flow is the scale where dissipation occurs, where molecular dissipation starts being important. By definition, that scale is where the Reynolds number corresponding to that scale is of order one. So if LD is the dissipation scale, the Reynolds number at the dissipation scale is ULD over molecular viscosity should be about one. Now you can put together how energy or RMS velocity and scale depend on one another through Komogorov spectrum, <clears throat> put the pieces together <clears throat> and you find that the dissipation scale is what we call the Komogorov scale. It's a viscosity to third power divided by dissipation rate and the whole thing to the one quarter power. <clears throat> viscosity in air is 10 to the minus five meters squared per second. Dissipation rate corresponds to about a watt per meter squared in the atmosphere. Put these together, the Komogorov scale is about a millimeter. Thereabouts could be tens of a millimeter to several millimeters. The largest scales in the atmosphere are planetary, tens of thousands of kilometers. Um, so let's just say 10 to the six meters, 10 to the seven meters perhaps. <clears throat> so the range of scales spans nine, perhaps 10 orders of magnitude. Now this is three dimensional flow. So the number of degrees of spatial degrees of freedom you would need to represent this flow in all its detail would be something like 10 to the 27, maybe 10 to the 30. We don't need to argue about the detail of the power here. The point is this is macroscopically enormous. There is no way to represent all of these scales in a computer simulation. And we already can't do it because of the macroscopic memory limitations. So we cannot resolve everything that matters. There's absolutely no way of doing that. <clears throat> 
so what are we to do? Um, you could hope machine learning helps us out of out here, and I think it does. But you have to keep in mind the degrees of freedom you need to constrain. So if the turbulent flow in the atmosphere has something like 10 to 27 degrees of freedom, we're getting order of tens of terabytes of data about Earth from space every day. So there are perhaps 10 to 13 degrees of freedom thereabouts. It's far removed from what you would need to constrain the three degrees of freedom we have with data alone. Importantly also, we cannot see a lot of the small scale features that are important for controlling climate, especially turbulence and clouds that I'll come to. That's really hard to observe from space. We currently cannot do it. Will computing help us out? Yes, it will. However, what's currently computationally feasible are computer simulations that have somewhere between 10 to the seven to 10 to the nine degrees of freedom. You can push it a bit further if you just want to do one big simulation, but if you want to do science, you want to be able to iterate, you know, 10 to the seven to 10 to the nine degrees of freedom is, is a reasonable range right now. 10 to the nine would be a large simulation requiring you know, tens of uh, petaflops, perhaps hundreds of petaflops to, to iterate and simulate for some time. So now we, now we can make a choice. Um, we want to use data, I'll come to data in a bit. We also want to use computing, but you cannot resolve all. So you have somewhere between 10 to seven to 10 to nine degrees of freedom to allocate and you can choose where you put them. You could choose to um, simulate the very small scales, which is what you would have to do if you want to explicitly simulate, for example, how droplets form in clouds. So then you would need a resolution at the scale of the Komogorov scale, a millimeter or so. You would get to domains that are of order a cubic meter, far cry from a cloud. It's helpful, but it's much too small to get to even a cloud scale. You could choose to invest in degrees of freedom at some intermediate range, so meter scale, say 10 meters in the horizontal, five in the vertical. That's a typical resolution we use in large eddy simulations of clouds and turbulence. So then you get to domain sizes that are perhaps 10 kilometers squared in the horizontal, five kilometers in the vertical. That's feasible right now. We are using such simulations extensively, but it's a far cry from a global simulation. Or you say, I really want a global simulation, but then you're forced to horizontal resolutions in the range of perhaps 20 kilometers. So that's what you get with 1,024 squared points in the horizontal. And um, in the vertical, resolution can be variable between say tens of meters near the surface and kilometers higher up. That gives you a global climate simulation with somewhere around you know, 10 to the eight degrees of freedom. And that's doable right now as well. But these are the choices we have. We can't do all, we have to pick where we invest the compute budget. And, and I'll talk about different choices you can make here and what they can reveal about the nature of turbulence. Um, so we cannot compute it. We have no complete theory. Richard Feynman is often quoted as saying turbulence is the most important unsolved problem of classical physics. The actual statements in his lectures is a little bit longer saying turbulence is a very old problem. It affects many fields. It's important for many fields from stars to convection in the interior of earth to weather. Um, and it hasn't been solved. It hasn't been solved for a long time and it still hasn't been solved. I want to talk about atmospheric turbulence a bit more specifically. <clears throat> and these spectral arguments are the success story of turbulence we've had. They apply to homogeneous and isotropic turbulence. However, atmospheric turbulence is neither isotropic nor homogeneous. Um, well, the, the rotational extension doesn't assume isotropy in the vertical, it just assumes isotropy, isotropy in, the, in the horizontal. But that's not so bad. Um, in, in homogeneous turbulence, the mean field without loss of generality is zero, uninteresting. But mean fields are already of huge interest to us. What is the mean temperature in some location? How does it vary in space? So not having homogeneity in isotropy is an opportunity because lower moments of the turbulent field become interesting. So we need to primarily predict mean fields and some low order moments, perhaps some high moments like precipitation extremes. How can we do it? Um, I first wanna talk about large scales and then thousands of kilometers and then wanna talk about smaller scales. The problems are quite different at those scales and tools are quite different, but the opportunities in some ways are similar. 
So the large scales I'm gonna talk about are <clears throat> large scale weather system. So here's an animation from weather forecasting model. What you'll see in white is water vapor and pink is evaporation and blue is precipitation. And <clears throat> you see this go, so it's a typical evolution of weather. And <clears throat> the key thing to take from it is that, especially in the extra tropics, the flow features have scaled, the most energetic flow features have scales of perhaps 3000 kilometers or so. They are very large scale. <clears throat> in the tropics, the situation is a bit different. You have this popcorn convection rain popping up. Um, I don't want to focus on that part right now. But in the exotropics, there are very large scale features that dominate the flow. This extratropical macro turbulence, macro because it's large and it's generated by large scale um, processes, is generated by baroclinic instability, an instability that converts potential energy generated by differential heating of the planet into kinetic energy. It has a characteristic scale at which this instability occurs, that's the Rossby radius, around 3000 kilometers or so. And that turbulence is responsible for just about everything in the exotropics. It's responsible for the bulk of the transport of mass, momentum, energy, water vapor, and the like. It transports energy forward and upward, and that stabilizes the stratification and moderates the pole equator temperature gradient. <clears throat> and the animation you just saw, you see that the turbulence looks quite wavy. It is weak turbulence that is characterized by waves interacting with more turbulent flow. And first question is why is it wavy rather than strongly turbulent? I'll come to that. What you need for any theory of climate, for any answer to basic questions like what controls the poorly created temperature gradient, is a theory of this macro turbulence. So a while back, I and several students and postdoc invested the compute budget we had into hundreds of simulations on large scales, the thousand kilometer scales going to hundreds of kilometers, but not smaller scales. And we did hundreds of simulations varying parameters controlling the planet, like the rotation rate and top is the zonal wind, the east-west wind, and magenta, blue is potential temperature, measure of entropy. The bottom is the same thing for a planet that rotates four times as rapidly you see on this four times as rapidly rotating planet, everything is shrunken in the latitude direction. The vertical axis is just a normalized pressure and the uh, horizontal axis is just south pole to north pole. So everything is shrunk you get multiple jets like somewhat what you see on Jupiter, for example. And it's just two examples of hundreds of simulations we did. And something interesting happened in these simulations and that is, the turbulence here transports heat upward and forward, and in doing so, it adjusts the stratification. It's clear it would, but what wasn't clear is how it would do so. What this plot shows is a measure of the stratification, the bottom to top temperature difference or potential temperature difference in the atmosphere versus a measure of the pole equator temperature gradient. And you see that the <clears throat> simulations all eventually for large enough temperature gradients condense on a line where there is a linear relation between this vertical stratification and the poly equator temperature gradient. And that linear line is quite special because <clears throat> the flow would need to cross that line for turbulent interactions between scales to be strong. The fact that it doesn't cross the diagonal line and it stays in the upper left is indicative of the turbulence being weak, wavy, having relatively weak interactions from one scale with another. The same point becomes even clearer by looking at energies in these simulations. And without going into the details of the theory here, suffice it to say that what's plotted here is a measure of the potential energy in the turbulent flow versus measure of the kinetic energy. And if interactions in this turbulence were strong, then the potential energy should see the kinetic energy here. It doesn't do that over eight decades of energies. It, it's a pretty stunning range and it still makes me happy to see these plots all these years later. You have an almost perfect equipartitioning of these energies. You can plot Earth on top of it. Earth in summer and winter falls into these lines as well. Simulations are relatively idealized. And you can always question how, how relevant it is for Earth. Earth falls squarely within these simulations. So that's so the clearest evidence we have that the turbulence organizes itself to be weakly nonlinear, to have weak nonlinear interactions across scales. <clears throat>
the atmospheric energy spectrum is consistent with that. This is the kinetic energy spectrum in the atmosphere. You have the K to the minus three or N to the minus three spectrum here. The crucial point is the energy is generated the Rossby radius, which is indicated here. That is also the radius where most energy resides. So the Rossby radius is linear concept. It's a linear instability measure. It comes from linear instability theory. The concepts from the linear theory are relevant for the real atmosphere, which is why it's useful to teach classes about Birkelandic instability and Rossby waves. You actually see them in the atmosphere. If turbulent interactions were strongly nonlinear, the energy containing scale, the peak of the spectrum, should be at larger scales than, than this, and that's not what we see. Okay, so the interactions are weakly nonlinear in atmospheric turbulence. So far, so good. Let's just say we set them to zero. And you can do it in the model. You can just eliminate all nonlinear triad interactions among scales. So here's the zonal wind again and some simulation we did, it's Paul Gorman in this case, a number of years ago. The top is a fully nonlinear model. That's really a ground truth in this case. The bottom is a closure that eliminates all nonlinear eddy eddy interactions. It's a cumulant expansion closure at second order. And the good news is you get a zonal wind that's not crazy. I mean, it has about the right magnitude, but the structure isn't quite right, right. The jets are too narrow compared to the top. But this is just, we only want to predict the mean fields. Here's a mean field. We get something that's not completely off by eliminating all nonlinear interactions. That should be surprising. So it's saying just having waves interact with a mean flow alone suffices to give, give you some reasonable zeroth order idea of what's going on in atmospheric turbulence. It's not good enough for climate model, but it's good enough for starting to being able to analyze the flow. Ask how can we fix this? How can we make it better? Um, it turns out you can make this better by keeping nonlinear interactions only in a few places. If you keep the nonlinear interactions only in vertically averaged flows, the barotropic flow, we call it, um, you get the bottom figure, and that gets a good bit closer to the top figure. The colors here don't need to worry about that the momentum fluxes. They were also the crux of why things weren't going well. And you get a good bit closer. So cumulant expansions, expansion of moment equations that you truncate at low order have some chance of giving you some success. Um, but they themselves are not good enough. You need to introduce some nonlinear interactions here. Barotropic triads are one option. The problem is as soon as you introduce them, it becomes analytically hard to make progress computationally. It's almost as hard, just as hard as solving the fully nonlinear equations. So it's still not a full solution to anything. However, there does seem to be evidence that the turbulence is constrained to be weakly nonlinear. It enables the use of truncated expansions, such as cumulant expansions and variance thereof. There remain a number of problems, especially about broken symmetries, that these expansions, once you truncate them, do not preserve higher moments, for example, which becomes important once you add water vapor to the picture. Water vapor in general is a big issue. Dual, there's a dual role of latent heat release. It stabilizes the stratification. It energizes the eddies. We do not have theories for that either. But what we do have are the tools to solve this problem now. I think what it needs is systematic experimentation and some bright physicists working on it. That's a big scale. So at small scales, we have even bigger problems. Um, small scales, the big problem are in clouds because clouds affect how climate will change. We've had about 1.2 degrees warming since the 1850s, and you all know that. The uncertainties, however, in predictions of global warming are very large. Um, here are projections from two emission scenarios from the latest round of IPCC simulations. And uh, for example, if you look at the two degree line, so it's saying two degree warming relative to pre-industrial times, you had 1.2 degrees already. And you look when all these simulations cross this two degree line, the x-axis is time and years. And you see there's a very wide spread of the year at which the um, this warming threshold is crossed, almost irrespective of emission scenario. There are enormous uncertainties. And these exist primarily because models do not know how to handle clouds well. Clouds dominate uncertainty in climate predictions. We cannot resolve them explicitly. 
<clears throat> climate models, we invest our compute budgets on scales larger than tens of kilometers. Clouds have dynamical scales of meters, tens of meters. So they literally fall through the crack of the computational mesh. The core challenge is bridging scales. <clears throat> what we have in a climate model are large scale variables. So variables on scales of tens of kilometers or larger, temperature, humidity, and the like. And what we need are macroscopic effects of clouds. What is their albedo, radiative effects, and the like, the impact on rainfall. And in between are these myriad of tiny processes involving, for example, droplet scale physics occurring on scales of micrometers that we have just no way of simulating explicitly. And we just need to bridge these scales in some effective way. How do we do it? I think the answer here is A, use data. We live in the golden age of Earth observations. I already mentioned we receive tens of terabytes of data about Earth every day. We've never had as much data about Earth and Earth atmosphere and climate system before. We also can generate data computationally. For example, we cannot look inside clouds, but we can simulate clouds quite, quite reliably. We just invest our compute budget, now at resolutions of meters. Here's just an example of a tropical cumulus simulation. Gray is a cloud, and blue is rainfall, and the bottom is a buoyancy or temperature. And these simulations are not, not just visually appealing. We can verify them against field, against field data. We know they're quite reliable. So we cannot do these simulations on a globe, but we can do them in domains up to 10, 10 kilometers or so on the side. So we can generate data computationally. And this group we started a few years ago called the Climate Modeling Alliance is we are set to use the opportunity to come from data, observational data, and from computing to improve climate models by improving the representation of small scale turbulence, especially in other small scale processes. Um, this by now is about 70 scientists at Caltech, at MIT, and JPL. And what we are doing together is built a climate model that's a physical model, logical processes, chemical processes that's informed with data. Now, <clears throat> Data will have to play a strong role here. Machine learning will have to play some role, but we have to remain mindful of what we want to do, which is predict the climate for which we do not have data. So it's absolutely crucial that whatever we do generalizes out of sample. It's crucial, I think, that whatever we do is interpretable so we can explain to people the model produces this heat wave, for example, for these reasons that remain traceable because we cannot verify predictions with new data very quickly. It will take a while before new data will invalidate or validate the model. And we want to use the climate model for practical decision-making, which means you need uncertainty quantification. Now, these three requirements can be met by combining what you might call reductionist science, physics, physics as we have practiced it, with data-driven approaches. Deep learning, its success rests primarily in over parameterization. It leads to very expressive models, but it does make generalizability and uncertainty quantification challenging. Reductionist science, Newton's second law, has been, of course, amazingly successful. It's extremely generalizable, interpretable, and makes uncertainty quantification easy, but it reaches its limits in systems as complex as your system, as complex even as a cloud. It would be nice to have a reductionist description of a cloud. It's hard to get it. So what we do is combine both reductionist science with deep learning data-driven approaches and in some ways use the best of both worlds. <clears throat> so we are using a physics AI hybrid approach to get to more accurate climate predictions. And what this means is that we're advancing theory and the primary role of theory is to reduce the demands on data. We cannot possibly constrain 10 to the 27 degrees of freedom with data alone but we can reduce the number of degrees of freedom we need to constrain by using the physics we know. We harness diverse data, observations, data generated computationally, multi-fidelity data and the like, and, and leverage computing power, for example, accelerator platforms that enable many high resolution simulations, for example, of clouds or ocean turbulence. Um, the machine learning parts of it, I think are very interesting. I don't want to go into any details of that here. I just want to say one thing, <clears throat> that the way you want to learn from data is treat learning as an inverse problem. It's a Bayesian inverse problem. 
What that enables you to do is use any data there are, not just labeled data that allow you to do supervised learning, for example. And specifically, we use time average climate statistics. It has many advantages. It leads to smooth problems to solve because statistics tend to be smooth in space and time. It focuses on what matters. Statistics is what we want to predict after all, even though we do it by, by resolving all sorts of details and aggregating in the end. And in order to learn from statistics, you need to treat machine learning as an inverse problem rather than say as a supervised learning problem. We have developed algorithms for doing so. I'm happy to talk with people about what they are and won't do it now. Um, Let me just give you an example how, the, how this actually works. And just a sketch from modeling clouds. What we do for modeling clouds is first homogenization, homogenization theory approaches. You take some grid box with some subgrid scale flow that we want to model, and we decompose that subgrid scale flow into coherent structures and more isotropically turbulent flows in coherent structures. And then you take an Stokes equation. Here is one version of those, or the continuity and the scalar mean equation, and coarse grain them over the coherent structures and the incoherent parts. And you say you have n different parts. You conditionally average the equations. We don't need to get into the details of what the equations are, but the usual situation arises that you conditionally average. You can do this exactly. However, on the right-hand side, unknown functions appear that we do not know a priori. These are closure functions that in some ways we need to infer. Here is our third moments appearing in second moment equation and the like. And these functions that we don't know are great targets for machine learning approaches. So this is what we do. We embed machine learning models in these functions, inform them with data, um, statistics of data, and then get a system that Physically, physically consistent, it conserves whatever you want to conserve, mass, energy, and the like, and um, reduces the demands on data. It needs a relatively sparse model, parametrically sparse models that are physically consistent by design because we built them to be physically consistent. <clears throat> so for physical systems, this works. It won't say necessarily work for modeling the biosphere in the same way, but for clouds, this is a, a fruitful approach. And then what we did is generate training data for these unknown functions. And we right now focus on computationally generated training data. So here we invest our compute budget in large eddy simulations with scales of tens of meters. And we have generated hundreds of them. Zhao Shen has generated them and they're publicly available. And we can now train our physically physics-based model with these simulations. The result that we get is, is just a few examples. It's, it's the first unified model of turbulence and convection that captures essentially all of Earth's cloud regimes. So our new model, it's a 1D model in the red line here. There's blue is a high-resolution simulation of cloud fraction in this case. In the stratocumulus area, there virtually every climate model has difficulty simulating clouds. Gray is a typical climate model, has about to factor two bias in cloud fraction. And <clears throat> our 1D model, it's in, in the um, dashed line here compared with field data from an aircraft. It's basically right on for cloud liquid. And it's roughly a factor 10 to the eight faster than a direct simulation of these, um, of, of these flows with large eddy simulations. So that's the success of combining physics with learning from data. So actually, I should say most of the success here is really just physics. There's very little learning from data in, in the results I'm showing here. We can do the same thing. The same scheme works for simulating deep convection. This is cloud forming over the Amazon rainforest. <clears throat> right is vertical velocity, left is cloud liquid, ice, and the center of precipitation. The key thing here is that there is a temporarily smooth evolution from boundary layer turbulence to deep convection that starts raining, which has not been possible in, in these parameterizations that have been used in the past before. They have discontinuous switches from one regime to another and cannot reproduce the smooth temporal evolution that we see here that actually occurs in nature. Next step for us is we need to put all of this in a global model. We're working on it as, as I speak and then inform the global simulations with actual data, global observations. And that's coming for us in fall and we're all 
excited to be seeing where this leads us. Um, <clears throat> summarize a few key points. Just about everywhere in climate, turbulence is at the heart of, of the big unsolved problems. There's a few big unsolved problems not involving turbulence, for example, involving the biosphere and the carbon cycle, but the big physical problems all involve turbulence in the atmosphere and the oceans. On large scales, we need a theory of macro turbulence as a basis for any theory of climate. You'd like to write a textbook on climate. This is how it works. It has to contain a theory of macro turbulence. On smaller scales, you need accurate models, reduced order models for turbulence, convection, and clouds to make climate predictions better. And that's simply an imperative for our science to deliver the information society needs to adapt to the climate changes that are going on. And progress in both areas is within reach. For, especially for the smaller scales, where there's a fundamental component, fundamental science component, a strong applied bent to it as well. <clears throat> Combining physical models and harnessing climate statistics together, I think is the way forward. It leads to sparsely parameterized models that a few examples I showed to you, they already capture turbulence regimes that have vexed climate models for decades. Maybe the, the big picture, broader point I want you to take away, and especially for the students, these are important problems, perhaps the most important problems we have in the climate sciences and, and perhaps the bigger sciences, the bigger physical sciences. We have new tools from math, new computational tools, new data science tools that we can, we can bring to bear on these problems. And if you pair them with physics, physical understanding, uh, physical science as we have practiced it for centuries, I think these, solve, these problems will become solvable. And I hope a decade from now, we will have made substantial progress, both on large and smaller scales. So I wanna leave you with that. If people want to read a bit more on bigger picture, we had an article in Physics Today in June, 2021 with Nadia Giovanni and Rob Sokolo. I encourage you to read it. Um, I'm happy to answer questions now. Thank you very much, Tapio, for the, for the fantastic uh, talk. So I encourage the audience to start typing the questions into the Q&A, and there are already a number of questions there. Of course, feel free to ask questions about the presentation, but also feel free to ask questions about the big picture. If you're a student, thinking about a career in climate, uh, physics, things like that, uh, those questions are also welcome. Uh, before uh, moving to Q&A, uh, I am posting the link to the website in the chat. Uh, so please check out their website, uh, sign up for the mailing list and the recording for the presentations will, uh, the link will be posted uh, on this website. So uh, there are already a number of questions in the chat. Uh, I can just run them through them. Go ahead. I can just go through. So the K to minus five third range in large scales for two problems by an upper cascade of energy. Yes, it would be but you do not see that upscale cascade of energy in the atmosphere. So that's part of the point I was trying to make that if the turbulent interactions were strongly nonlinear, you should, should see this upscale cascade, but we do not see a clear minus five thirds upscale energy spectrum. <clears throat> um, Tim Del Sol was asking with, with these uh, simulations with truncated expansion, is there a significant computational savings? No. What I showed you is not realizing any computational savings. It was just proof of concept. In principle, if you could make these truncated expansions work, you can solve for the statistics directly, solve for fixed points directly that would result in computational savings, but we are not there. I mean, the, the methods aren't good enough to, to do this in a meaningful way. So right now, it's not yielding faster models yet. Energy consumption of computing and machine learning, how can we, how can we reconcile that with the goal of understanding and slowing climate change? Yes, it's a good question. Um, the, the computing demand of, of climate simulations, of some simulations I showed you, is, the energy demand is truly staggering. Um, all I can say is that the, the energy per flop has been steadily decreasing, so it's getting somewhat better, but it is an issue. I mean, it is a, it is a significant contribution to our carbon balances, can't deny it. Let's see. How vast or small is the veil of the results of the machine learning algorithm that quantify atmospheric chunks that you've mentioned? I'm not quite sure I understand the question. So the, the simulations we on which we base this, large eddy simulations are all publicly available. You can find on our webpage, there's a link to it. Um, 
in the algorithms, likewise, everything we do is open development, open source. If you go to the Klima webpage, it's all there. Actually, I think some students just uh, volunteered to write a blog post introducing the algorithms that they become a bit easier to for others to use. So I hope this will be, be there sometime soon. Uh, Tim Dussel, great success with machine learning algorithms for subscale fertilizations. There's still problems. Um, actually, Tim, I should say the the results I showed you, they didn't rely much on, on machine learning. The, the great success here was physics, and maybe should have emphasized this more. I mean, there were things that a number of students did, uh, in, for example, Ignacio Lopez Gomez figuring out how to model mixing length and turbulent flows based on first principles. That was the key, much more so than the learning. Uh, there's, in the end, very few parameters we had to adjust with data. What are problems? Um, well, we haven't done this in a global simulation yet, so we are working hard on making this happen. This is going to be the big, the big test, right? How well does it actually work in a global simulation? So I'd like to answer the question once we see that. Um, oh, atmospheric turbulence appears to be wavy with weak interactions of scales. That was for Earth. Any thoughts on how this applies on, say, Jupiter? Um, Actually, I think so. These simulations I showed you cover sort of Jupiter-like flow regimes. Um, I think it applies to Jupiter as well. It's a bit harder to tell because the stratification further down in Jupiter is very weak. It's almost neutral. But it is true that the, for example, Rossby radius you can estimate for Jupiter is very close to the energy-containing scale, and it seems you can account for flow that looks Jupiter-like with these weak wave-mean flow interactions as well. What are new physics you hope AIML could help us discover? I think our approach is to use the physics we know and let AIML fill in the blanks in that physics rather than really discovering new physics. Um, I, I, in, in this area, I haven't seen machine learning approaches discovering new physics. What you can't do is you could use machine learning approaches and discover physics we already know that works, but truly new things I haven't seen seen that happening yet. Um, what are your views regarding computational complexity, weakly nonlinear nature, and the potential of physics and form ML when it comes to simulating snow transport and turbulent atmosphere, uh, snow transport and catabatic flows? Yeah, I think snow is part and parcel of what I was talking about, right? So it's uh, the phase transitions make make the small scale turbulence hard and interesting, uh, liquid ice phase transitions. And the challenge with ice especially is, and snow generally is that, but when you talk about a raindrop, it suffices to say there's a raindrop, it's spherical to a good approximation and that, that, that gets you quite far. With ice, snow, the challenge is to distinguish between different forms ice can take, snow, grapple, hail, different habits of ice crystals. <clears throat> so in, intricate microphysical processes start to play a role that we likewise do not know how to model well. I didn't talk about that, but there are also new compu computational tools, like Lagrangian particle simulations, that I think are starting to help in this area as well. So it's another example of you know, you have 10 to 8 degrees of freedom to invest, invest them in uh, particle simulations of microphysics, you can make progress there as well. Energy transfer to ocean and deep ocean circulation, how is this modeled? I mean, <clears throat> we say in this field, the ocean is like an atmosphere, except it's dry, which is a bit of a quip saying that there's no light and heat release in the oceans, and that complicates things. So it, it's modeled just like in the atmosphere. The challenge in the ocean is that the what is a large scale in the atmosphere is 1,000 kilometers, a large scale in the ocean is 10 kilometers. So it becomes harder even to resolve the weather in the ocean, what would be a 1,000 kilometer scale in the atmosphere. It's 10 kilometers in the ocean, becomes hard to resolve. So the energy transfer and, and transport um, by what the oceanographers call mesoscale turbulence is just on the cusp of what's being computationally feasible, which makes the ocean problem a bit, a bit harder because in the atmosphere, the equivalent of those scales we can resolve easily. What makes the ocean problem a bit easier is that it's dry, no phase changes matter, but the scales make it harder. To train the closure problem with data, we still need to propose the form of the closures, right equations. Do we have that at hand or need to explore around with more and more observations? My, my take here is that 
to get these equations, we need to use approaches like homogenization theory to get at the equations. And that's what we were doing. I was just sketching it. The challenge in doing that is knowing when to stop. At some point, probably the theory will introduce structural errors. You don't want to go so far that your models become wrong. You want to learn that from data, perhaps correction terms from data. But our approach really is start from first principles, Newton's law, laws of thermodynamics, course going from there. I'll be on. Do you want to go ahead? Yeah, just it's a quick question. Um, is there some intuition for why including the nonlinear parts of the barotropic modes is more important than those coupling barotropic and baroclinic? Yeah, there is. Um, essentially, the barotropic mode, these, these uh, the vertically average flow is what evicts other tracers primarily. <clears throat> so it's the nature of this cause geostrophic turbulence that that would be even more strongly true if, if the flow would be more strongly nonlinear, the energy cascades to large scales in the vertical too, mm -hmm. if it were to cascade. And so that becomes the most important um, part of the flow. But again, the challenge that, you know, you can model that and we can show that improves things. Tyndall Sol asked the question, does it save any computing? It doesn't. I mean, the, the examples I showed you, they're just as expensive um, with these closures as they are running the fully nonlinear simulation. Ciao. Yeah, so um, yeah, th thank you so much again for a beautiful talk. Um, and because I saw many questions are related to the uh, intersection between ML model and and and, um, and you know climate um, scientists, I was wondering, um, could you share some insight regarding um, the point you made in your talk about how ML can be used to solve particularly inverse problems? And for understanding the state climate statistics. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so what we do is we put these machine learning models pretty deep inside a physical model that we derived by homogenizing equations, which means there's some model that's a bit of a black box for the purposes of a machine learning algorithm where you like to train a neural network or even just a linear regression model, something else inside that box. And the box isn't easily or at all differentiable. So it becomes harder to use with off-the-shelf machine learning algorithms that rely on things like backpropagation. So we are doing is we use gradient-free methods to solve the problem based on ensemble common inversion and variance. So we use ensemble methods that are computationally quite efficient um, to solve ultimately the optimization problem, minimizing some loss function that you need to define, um, adjusting weights and biases and networks and the like. So it's in some ways not too different from standard supervised learning. You have a loss function that you minimize, just what you do not have are labeled data in the form of input-output pair of the process that you're trying to model this way. To give you concrete examples, one crucial process we're trying to model is the exchange of air between a cloud and the environment around it. And we cannot measure that ex exchange from data. It's even really hard to diagnose it from numerical simulations. But the, the, the interaction between the clouds and the environment that, that's modeled by this exchange is really crucial for determining cloud properties. So if you vary how you model this exchange, you have measurable impacts on cloud cover and other cloud statistics. So what we do is minimize the loss based on observable statistics to learn about these unknown functions where we don't have labeled input output pairs, but we can hypothesize, you know, this function depends on six non-dimensional groups, it turns out, or that's what we assumed in any case. So you do this to non-dimensional groups and then learn functions of these non-dimensional groups by minimizing a loss based on observable quantities through gradient-free methods. That's that's the gist of it. Right, and so it's sort of using um, a ML model to parameterize the relationship between these six non-dimensionalized groups. Yeah, say. yeah, exactly. Yeah, and to put the ML model really where we don't know how to deal with it physically on this exchange, for example, <clears throat> rather than trying to model the entire cloud by an ML model, ML model which I think would would pose huge demands on the data you would need. Yeah. 
been cool. Thanks. Hey, thank you, Tapio. <laughs> I, I know you are actually traveling and currently in a, in a workshop, so I don't know whether you have time for a few no, more questions okay. or four more questions in the Q&A. Yeah. Uh, so are there different machine learning algorithms implemented to model atmospheric states? If so, what are the advantages different methods you used? <clears throat> Um, let's see, to model atmospheric states, so the state estimation problem, that's what weather forecasting centers do. You use data simulation methods. For um, machine learning algorithms inside these say, cloud models I used, we're currently experimenting pretty widely. We have experimented with neural networks. We're experimenting with Fourier neural operators, with random feature models. Um, so far, the answer from our experiments is you can use any one of them. Um, However, none of them is much better than our handmade physical model or linear regression model so far. So we haven't really seen a great advantage of overparameterizing in this area. We are working on trying to get there. So in terms of ML algorithms, I don't think we have a winner yet, um, except to say, because we have this strong physical scaffolding, you can't go too wrong. I mean, that's really reassuring. It, you, you, you get reasonably right solution for any approach we have tried, which is quite different when you just try to try to represent the entire cloud dynamics by ML models. Uh, you mentioned that we haven't discovered new physics from ML. Um, do you think the approach to search for subgrid scale models using machine learning neural networks is flawed? Um, since the approach is to interpret these SGS models, link them to or discover physics. Um, Karan, I, suspect you're referring to symbolic approaches so where you use dictionary learning Cindy type approaches to learn uh, differential equations for these subgrid scale models definitely not flawed i think it's well worth trying um pedram has tried um laura zana will talk in the series soon she has tried and successfully tried what this has usually led to though is is rediscovering models we already knew and it often leads to stability challenges I think the approach is worthwhile. We're pursuing the approach as well. Um, my statement was just, we haven't learned anything new yet. New yet. New yet. Maybe it'll come. The, the problem with these approaches, or the central problem is if, if your right solution is, is well represented in your dictionary from which you're learning, well, then you can discover it, right? But as soon as your dictionary is imperfect, you can get pretty complicated functions. And some examples of that happening that don't actually become much more interpretable than a neural network. Um, can you comment on the interaction between cloud formation and internal gravity rays? There was a mix mechanism change with the presence of clouds. So gravity waves shape clouds. You can, you can see it, you know, these beautiful cloud bands behind mountains that are shaped by gravity waves. The question is, do the clouds also shape gravity wave breaking? Uh, good question. I haven't seen much evidence of that happening, but I guess it could. Next question is from Aditi Shastradri, who is the expert on gravity waves. She probably should answer that question. Um, the quasi-linear approximation doesn't seem to work particularly well in capturing the variability of the stratosphere. Yes, I mean, I don't know precisely, Aditi, what you're referring to, but there are plenty of examples where it doesn't work particularly well. I think a key issue is what I mentioned, the broken symmetries and preserving higher moments, especially of tracers. So in particular, you do not preserve maxima and minima of tracers directed in this closure, and you can get various maxima and minima that become very strange and wrong. Um, what's the state of affairs for any viscosity models within climate simulations? So again, in, you, know, you have your compute budget, take your 10 to the nine degrees of freedom and your 100 petaflops that someone gives you somewhere and you invest them somewhere and the scales that you don't model, you need to represent in some fashion, which means you know, with the small scales you can't resolve, you need to represent them usually by some dissipation. So we, in climate models, these models tend to be quite simple. That tends to be hyper diffusion. Um, the reason being that it's primarily entropy that cascades to small scales and you mostly need to mop up this entropy cascade. So what you want is a reasonably scale selective damping at, at the smaller scales. And the smaller scales here being you know, tens of kilometers or so not that small. Um, I think if you would approach scales that are much finer in models, that becomes a much more serious question. We have more 3D turbulence and the question of how good your subgrid scale model is becomes more serious. Right now, that's 
not a severe limitation, I would say, in climate modeling. Okay, great. Uh, again, thank you very much, Tapio, for, for the fantastic oh, presentation perfect. and for, for the discussion. So please join me in uh, thanking Tapio again. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's fun to have the discussion, at least online. Thank you. Yeah. Great, thank you very much, everyone. And uh, so the next presentation will be by uh, Professor Morgan O'Neill from Stanford University, and she'll be talking about storms and hurricanes. So we'll see you. Uh, next month and thank you very much have a good day thanks <laughs>